Good morning. Welcome to the Deep 404. Uh, today I want to talk a little bit about Germany, what's happening there, and contrast that a little bit with what's happening in Russia. Um, talk a little bit about some of the battlefront developments in Ukraine. There have been some big things happening in the last couple of days. And then talk a little about some other developments to do with uh, weaponry that's being used in the in the conflict. Um, but I'll just start off with um, obviously a big piece of geopolitical news, the death of Henry Kissinger at age 100. Um, he was, I suppose, most famous for his uh, role as the Secretary of State to President Nixon. Um, Back in the back in the sixties, um, and his involvement in Vietnam, um, operations that extended into Laos and Cambodia, um, and then his involvement in the nineteen seventy three coup in Chile, um, the CIA in two thousand, I think it was, came out in about two thousand and sort of confirmed that yes, they had been involved in that coup, and. Henry Kissinger um, reportedly uh, instrumental in, in driving that in terms of a foreign policy operation in throwing over the socialist government of Salvador Allende, um, who was then replaced by Pinochet. Um, that, and when that military uh, junta took over in Chile, that coup was enacted, that ended the civilian a rule of the country at that stage. It fell back under military rule then. Um, so yeah, Henry Kissinger, there's a lot of very differing opinions on him, depending on where you sit, I guess, on the political spectrum. Um, many people see him as a great statesman. A lot of people see him as a great warmonger and you know, someone who has led to the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people over the years. I won't go into... Um, a detailed review of, of Henry Kissinger today. But anyhow, Germany. Now, Germany is suffering in um, in terms of its economy at the moment. And this isn't brand new news, but there does seem to be a wealth of bad news for Germany at the moment. Now, part of this, and the reason why I'm speaking about it here on this channel, I guess, is because we've been talking a lot about the Ukrainian-Russian conflict, and Germany, obviously have been one of the most vociferous and strongest supporters of Ukraine throughout this Russian special military operation. And they have provided um, they've provided arms and financial aid and humanitarian aid and they've provided leopard twos and now leopard ones and we have reportedly the first video of the of, of uh, sorry, first fo photographs of a leopard one that has now been um, disabled um, and the crew abandoned it. So <clears throat> because of that, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Germany and then contrast it a little bit with Russia. Tire manufacturing is a big thing. Now, Germany is an industrialized nation. After World War II, they became heavily industrialized and until perhaps 10 years ago, remained as a very strongly industrial nation. Um, they have, however, over the last few years had green left-leaning governments and that um, their commitment to things such as the climate change agenda um, has led them down a path of deindustrialization. Um, they have made decisions which have made it difficult for them to obtain cheap energy and any developing nation, well not a developing nation in Germany's a case, but any industrial nation which wishes to remain as one needs energy, lots and lots of energy. Um, things like smelting and making metals and forming materials, all of that sort of stuff takes lots of electricity. Um, manufacturing tyres, it seems, takes energy. Um, Michelin um, are closing three factories. They're a major tyre manufacturer. Uh, today, in, this is reporting from two days ago. Today in Germany, Michelin is announcing it will gradually cease the production at its Karlsruhe and Trier sites, as well as the new tyre and semi-finished products manufacturing of Homburg. 
Um, Michelin will also transfer the customer contact center from Karlsruhe to Poland. 1,532 employees are impacted by these operations, which are meant to be completed by the end of 2025. Um, so this is big news, a major German tyre manufacturer cl closing down three of its production facilities, moving its customer contact centre out of Germany and into Poland. Um, the, a lack of competitive, competitiveness of the German operations for the European and export markets is what uh, Michelin claim as being part of the reasons. Michael Berthel, who's a chief economist of the German Rubber Manufacturers Association, the WDK, commented that um, the situation is not healthy, and this may be an understatement. Um, he believes that an uncertain future awaits more than half of Germany's tyre manufacturing locations. Um, Maria Rotger, she's responsible for Michelin's business in Germany, cited increased competition from cheaper Asian manufacturers and the surge in production costs, particularly energy, as primary reasons for the decision. So um, <clears throat> they are seeing competition from primarily China, but other than Asian nations, but primarily China. Uh, China is, uh, I believe, embarking upon the development of something like 20 new coal-fired power plants. Uh, Germany, which was in the sweetest position it could have been with a number of nuclear power plants had closed them down and mothballed them. Um, it's now looking to try to restart its nuclear energy industry. But as I've said previously, any complex system that you shut down, it's a lot easier to shut it down than it is to start it up. And so the Germans are, are encountering this, that once you have um, taken people out of the industry, have roles working in the nuclear industry, which have specialist skills, move them off somewhere else, they don't all want to come back. They've, you know, they've aged now. You may not have brought up the younger generation to have those skills. It makes it very tough to turn it back on. Um, <clears throat> so those rising costs in Germany of natural gas and electricity, which are crucial um, to tyre production, these are making their costs escalate such that they are moving out of the business. And it, 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 sorry, it appears as though, pardon me, <coughs> in the case of Michelin, that it is a complete downsizing of this business. Um, they don't, they're, not, they're not suggesting that they are merely moving their facilities somewhere else. It appears as though they are closing those facilities and downsizing the entire manufacturing business overall, which is not good for the German economy. Uh, this move by Michelin follows a similar move by the US tire maker Goodyear who earlier this month announced, this is in November, we've just moved into December, this was in November, has announced it would cease production at two of its manufacturing facilities in Germany, resulting in a loss of around 1,750 jobs. So major, not just one, but a number of major tyre manufacturers in Germany um, shutting down production, not moving to other locations to produce, but actually shutting down production and reasons being the cost of production and primarily the cost of energy and electricity to produce. Um, now, there's a whole heap of things that are compounding these problems to Germany. Um, the only silicon producer in Germany, RW Silicium, has gone bankrupt. Uh, well, will go bankrupt. They're predicting in March of 2024. It's on the way now. But uh, so Germany's only silicon producer. They have four furnaces used for production. Three of those are already mothballed. Um, and this is due to the price of energy, of the power of running those furnaces. Um, the reason why this is a particular problem to lose a, a, an industry or to lose a manufacturer in the silicon industry is that silicon is used in the manufacture of computer chips. So Germany is now, by losing this capability domestically, now going to rely upon imports of silicon-based products and chips and 
primarily this is going to start to come from nations, again, Asian nations and China. So Germany, in entering to this special military operation, losing its access to its cheap gas from Russia, um, and rising in, uh, in import costs on energy because it's now needing to go through third-party intermediaries and pay premiums. Uh, all of this is pushing them to then go and purchase products from China. So the idea of um, the Western sanctions working against Russia and the blocking of the sale and export of Russian products to, to Europe um, really seems to have boomeranged on nations such as Germany, where now they are suffering terribly. And they will be, if they're not careful, they will be suffering here for decades. Um, as, as I say, again, there are rising nations who are not making these mistakes that Germany has made, and they will be drawing in talent. And over the next 10 or 20 years, it's quite possible that people will just choose to go to those nations and work in that developing nation rather than one which appears to be struggling and in decline. And while Germany, of course, will change government next year, um, most likely they will, or they will in the near future anyhow, to reverse this destructive green approach they've taken to their economy because it just economically that makes no sense for them um, they may be too late and they may find that Germany just won't achieve the industrialized heights that it had in the past um, further you know further sources so I've got some sources here from different locations uh, Dr. Matthew Wilicki um, who, who's a who's a very uh, interesting, intelligent guy. You'll find him on on Twitter uh, most predominantly. He's reported that um, the German residential electricity grid operators have enabled um, the ability to curtail the flow of power to heat pumps and electric vehicle chargers in order to preserve the stability of the grid, which is lacking from chronic underinvestment. So you can see how these problems are starting to surface um, as Germany moves into winter. The grid operators have now got some legislation in place where they're able to say, well, actually, we're going to be controlling the power distribution. Like, we know it might be cold, but in your apartment block, power will go to heat pumps only between the hours of 6 and 9 p.m. or something. After 9 p.m., it will be turned off, or it'll come on again at 3 in the morning. Um, you, as a German citizen, may not necessarily have the autonomy over your heating that you have had in the past. Um, and in a similar example, it seems that this is going to be applied to electric vehicle chargers. Now, this is something which people who are against the concept of the move to renewable energy en masse, not because moving to renewable energy as a concept is a bad idea, but because it's not a practical one. And th again, this is an example of it, of it now, where if you don't have enough electricity in your country, moving lots of people to electric vehicles just creates a problem that you can't service. If you can't actually deliver electricity across the country at all times so that people can use those electric vehicles, then you've generated a problem and you'll start to see a, a slowing in demand for electric vehicles. Anyhow, that's a whole nother topic. I've, I might actually get... Dr. Wilicki, ask him and see if he'll come on the show and we'll talk a little bit about energy and the impact it's going to have in you know, Europe and things like that in the future. Um, so just before I finish up on Germany, unemployment has hit 5.9% in November 2023. Uh, this is the highest level in the last two and a half years. It's gone up from 5.8% last month, and this means an additional 22,000 people have lost their jobs during the month in November. Now, rising unemployment in, in Germany, um, we, we contrast that with the reports coming out of out of Russia, and some of that I'll, I'll get to I'll get to in a in a moment. But um, Russia, after all the sanctions have been imposed upon it, uh, after all of the initial hardship that caused, again the boomerang effect here was 
it focused the Russians on domestic production and um, Russian businessmen who had money overseas were suddenly sanctioned and sold properties overseas and withdrew money from foreign banks and all of that has resulted in investment in Russia, investment in the domestic production of their goods and services. Um, <clears throat> So Russia is not suffering from um, an unemployment growth. They're suffering from a labour shortage at the moment due to the amount of work that's going on in the in mil military sector. But Germany, employment is on the rise, worse in two and a half years. Um, the US economy, now there's some interesting reporting here. There's reports that the GDP in the US grew by 5.2%. However... Government spending in the same period grew by 5.5%. So while it's not a direct correlation, but if you took out the government spending, which is debt, this is a government getting into more debt, and the Americans have got trillions of dollars of debt, it's, it, that's, not, that's not actual growth. The government spending isn't actual growth. If you were to remove that, then GDP doesn't look very strong or very good overall for the for the US for the period. Um, now, I'm not saying the government can't spend. Of course, the government's got to spend. But government spending, 5.5%, it's a, it's a lot. The Americans are getting themselves into trouble with the ability of being able to service their debt. Um there have been some there have been some american um financial people who have suggested that look this isn't really a problem for the us because the us can always just print more money they've got the fed if they need to pay a trillion dollars in debt they'll just print a trillion dollars in debt um of course, that doesn't really solve the problem because then you have just devalued your dollar and you're just going to increase inflation. And now that the American currency is not the um, global titan currency that it was, it is being mm, de-dollarized. Uh, BRICS group are moving to create their own currency, which they will use for their international trading. They're building their own banking system to compete with SWIFT. They're also already starting to trade in their national currencies rather than trading in the US. So this then means that it becomes harder for the US to then export inflation overseas um, in the future. So while that once may have been a go-to for the US to say, we'll just print our way out of this debt, so I think this now they're losing the ability to do that and doing that will just deepen the f uh, inflationary crisis that they would be um, that they would find themselves in. Um, <clears throat> a little bit on some um, some updates in technology. The there's new Russian technology we spoke about the other day. These are called the termites. The termites are an MDPO1 unmanned aerial vehicle. They look like about a quarter to one third scale helicopter. It's basically what they look like. Um, they weigh 450 kilograms. They've got a top speed of 150 kilometers per hour. So they they move along okay. Um, not super fast, but you know, fast enough to fast enough to outrun smaller drones and um, straight line fast enough to outpace vehicles, most vehicles. They can travel at an altitude of up to 3.5 kilometers or 3,500 meters. <clears throat> That's pretty high up for a little for a little unit and they can carry three laser guided missiles. So um, they will be reusable. So they're, you know, they're going to be able to um, fly out, fire their missiles, and then turn around and come back and then be loaded up with some more missiles and be sent off again. So rather than sending out a very expensive attack helicopter, which can do more. I mean, an attack helicopter can carry more weaponry than that. But they're very expensive. 
And more importantly, they carry two humans. They've got two pilot, pilot and co-pilot in there, and they are very expensive to train. You know, the associated long-tail cost of a helicopter is enormous when you consider the maintenance required for it. And this is because the maintenance of a helicopter, they need to be larger to carry heavier weight, to carry two people. They need to be able to try to ensure that those people remain alive. So again, there's a lot of extra weight, armory, armament, redundant systems, and all of this sort of thing. And to fire nine or 15 or 24 missiles, let's say at a maximum. I don't know, I'm not a helicopter expert, but let's say if you can... Replace that with a couple of small, cheap, disposable helicopters. Where if you lose one of them, you don't lose any of your men. Um, they can be com- they can be flown, you know, remotely controlled remotely. Um, they don't need any of the armament. They don't need all the redundant systems. So the size and cost of them comes down. The maintenance cost comes down. You're not training helicopter pilots now. Training a helicopter pilot as opposed to training someone to fly an FPV drone, which is effectively how you would fly these, I would imagine, um, it takes something from months, if not years, to hours and days. In a few hours, you can have someone flying a drone. In a few days, they can be proficient. In a couple of weeks, they can be very good. Um, With a helicopter pilot, you need to start off in simple helicopters. You need to spend a great period of time to be able to just get off the ground. And then if you're talking about flying attack helicopters, these things are considered to be the most difficult helicopters of all to fly. Um, So you remove that monstrous cost, you remove the likelihood of your men being killed on the front line, and you replace it with uh, large numbers of small, nimble, unmanned, controllable vehicles. So they're coming, there's Russian termites. We'll see those entering the conflict next year, I imagine. Um, In terms of Russian electronic warfare, there have been some pictures come out this week which are reportedly showing a new capability of Russian electronic warfare uh, ability to interfere with visual satellite imagery. Now, what was shown was a satellite picture with a large area grayed out, not grayed out, but um, distorted. It looked like lines were sort of scratched through it. And this is reportedly due to new electronic warfare capability. Um, one of these devices, you would imagine, would be sat somewhere around. It seemed to cover quite an area. Scale wasn't given, but it was a satellite map. So it appeared as though it was, you know, perhaps hundreds of metres or kilometres of square area covered. I don't have the details. I'm sure we'll hear more about this, though, if if this is correct. Um, But you would imagine that you would set up a few of these around areas where you are going to have air defence systems um, or airports so that visual ability of your um, enemy or your opponent to be able to use their satellites and view what is on the ground would be disrupted. Now, satellites don't just use visual capability. They use a number of different wavelengths of light for sensing. So they have other means of being able to determine what is there and on the ground. But still, visual capability, being able to knock that out, makes things more difficult for your opponent. Um, and so, yeah, that that new capability seems to blind to the visual spectrum satellites within an area of wherever this electronic warfare device was. Um, talking a little bit about jets here. Now, it appears that uh, Iran is claiming that they have done a deal with Russia to purchase some jets and that Russia will provide Iran with Su-35 jets and Mi-28 attack helicopters. Um, now, the, the Su-35s will replace MiG-29s, which were purchased in the 1990s by Iran. So that's a big step up um, in terms of capability for the Iranian Air Force. The Mi-28 helicopters, the attack helicopters, these are called Night Hunters, uh, is their nickname. Um, they are especially robust. So while the KA-52s, the alligators, um, they're an attack helicopter, they sit with the pilots seated side by side, single cockpit side by side. The um, 
the MI-28s sit in a formation with the pilot in front and the co-pilot behind, each of them in an independent cockpit. So these are really durable helicopters. Um, they have Each of them have a specially fortified cabin for each of the pilots, and they have superior night fighting capabilities. Um, they are reportedly at the moment operating around the Donetsk area um, and having success picking off uh, Ukrainian pieces, armoured armored vehicles and armoured equipment. Uh, tactically, though, reports are that they are being used in combination with the KA-52s. Um, the KA-52s have countermeasure against laser, laser and infrared guided munitions such as the Stinger missiles, the ground-launched, man-launched Stinger missiles, uh, man-portable missiles. And the MI-28s have countermeasures against radar-guided missiles. So the thinking is that they fly them now out in groups, in pairs, and um, that gives them the ability to provide protective cover from each other, from both radar-guided attacks and from laser and infrared-guided attacks. Um, I don't know how successful that is. I don't know the technicalities. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not a weapon systems expert, so I don't know the technicalities of how they integrate communications and look to protect one another in that way. But that tactically is what, being, is, what is being suggested, is that how they are now being used, and that this was a... Um, a tactical change adopted by the Russians during 2022 um, after some initial, um, while well, they had some initial successes with the, uh, the KF-52s, there was then some losses reported um, after being attacked by Ukrainians. Um, and so they attack, the Russians tactically devised a way to send these two different attack helicopters out with different capabilities, working as a team, and are better able to protect themselves. Um, going on, still talking about jets and things that fly. So this week, again, continued reports of Ukrainian losses. A MiG-29 and an Su-25 reportedly shot down northwest of Avdiivka. And also, um, what appears now to be footage of a Su-25 decoy having been damaged by a Lancet. So this came out a couple of days ago. Footage came out. It was claiming it was an Su-25, which was um, struck by a Lancet. That then quickly sort of turned around people got some footage of what was the, what the plane was and looking at it and I'm not, yeah, I'm not, a, I'm not a, an air force aircraft specialist either but looking at the um, distinctive uh, engine positioning of an su-25 versus this what you could see in this photograph it doesn't match what an su-25 looks like and and also the 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 damage done to it I get the impression that it may have been a decoy that was actually struck. So the Russian Lancet struck a Ukrainian a decoy of an Su-25. Now, that, but that, however, that is not the real story here. The real story here is that this attack happened in a Krivoy Rog airfield, and that's so that's in like northwest of the um, Zaporozhia Kharkovka reservoir area, northwest up there. But the attack happened 100 kilometers behind the front line. So while it may have been a decoy that was hit, um, there's video of the Lancet striking. So that means that at 100 kilometres from the front line, the Lancet and the Orlans, and the Orlans are like the control reconnaissance team member for the Lancets, they appear to now be successfully operating at a range of at least 100 kilometres. Um, <clears throat> so that's a growth in range for the Lancets from when they started. Um, and as I've said before, the Lancets are now coming out with new swarming capabilities, enhanced capabilities, where groups of them will now go up and they will select targets and share them between themselves. And then ultimately they will do, <clears throat> they will do assessments on each other's strikes. So if one hits a tank and then the tank continues to move or the tank doesn't erupt in flames, it doesn't look like it has actually suffered a fatal 
attack, then another lancet will assume it as its target and will also go after it. But if the other, if the first one hits and the lancets can determine visually and using some AI that, okay, that was a successful strike, we won't waste ourselves on that one, we'll go after the next one. So <clears throat> lancets growing in capability. Now, the um, along the front line, uh, I'll just go to a map here for a second. So this is Donetsk City here, just here. Now there have been, um, there has been Russian advances and successes like all over the line, but some particular areas just west of uh, west of Bakhmut. So Bakhmut's a little north from where we are here, but um, west of Bakhmut. We have, there's Bakhmut there. We have uh, Kromovo here. Is now come under Russian control. Now, Kromovo to the west of Bakhmut here, when the Russians under, um, under Wagner, under Evgeny Prigozhin's control earlier in the year, assumed control of Bakhmut, they didn't get as far as Kromovo. They didn't take Kromovo. Um, reporting is that today, unlike in May, early this year, that it has now come under Russian control. So the Russians having success, moving further to the west here. Um, Kleshevka. Yet reporting that the Russians are now getting across the railway line here as well and getting down and uh, yeah, taking control of the northern parts of Klyshevka. Andrivka, the Ukrainians who had made it across to the railway line, have now been pushed out of Andrivka, and Andrivka just rests in grey zone at the moment. There's been flattened. It's a tiny little settlement. It's just been flattened. There's nothing left there to actually go in and defend. Um, Avdivka, of course... This is where there's been a lot of news just north, um, just north of Donetsk city. Avdiivka falling under Russian control um, more and more by the by the day. Uh, step over, step over here has been um, contested. Now earlier in the week, reports were that the Russians had gone into Step over and had um, pushed the Ukrainians out. They were forced back out again. They came under heavy Ukrainian shelling and have been forced back out. And it appears that they are still fighting over the claiming this area and then likely would move on to Berichi here um, and also be able to then circle down from the north towards the coke plant, which is this area here. Um, continued reports of um, people sur surrendering, um, retreating out of uh, areas of Avdivka. Um, and if we go Donetsk here, so it's Donetsk City, city. Marinka. Now, Marinka has been under Ukrainian control for the last 10 years. Um, it is now falling to the Russians. So again, just as a an indication of how the tide has turned from the Ukrainian offensive, which went for four months and gained a few pockets and small settlements in the Varemka Ledge and down near Robotny, but nothing more than that took a little bit of Kleshevka for a little for a little while that has all been being pushed back currently and here we see an area which has been a stronghold for Ukraine since the start of the conflict in 2014 is now um, expected to fall in its entirety to to Russia today or in the next few days there is a small area here just in this northwestern area just underneath the reservoir here that appears to still be under Ukrainian control. However, drone footage that I saw this morning showed a drone flying through these western streets here um, and they didn't show any Ukrainian 
forces. Um, the drone wasn't shot down and they showed a house somewhere in this area around here with a Russian flag held up on top, um, positioned on top of what was remaining of the, the building. So it certainly seems as though the Russians are taking um, Marinka and that that will happen shortly. This leaves the Russians then, if they do take Marinka, with the ability to move northwest along this line of settlements here, or then to start to push down to the south along this line of settlements, which runs up through here. Um, so it will we will see what the what the Russians do whether they look to just solidify perhaps a position along here straighten this line out and um, and yeah join up with the forces here at Voldaha. I'm, yeah, I, I'm I'm tactically I don't know what the plans are here yet but they are definitely the Russians are definitely making ground here and capturing areas that they have not been in control of since the conflict started. Um. Talking about that, so President Zelensky has reported now that he has changed his tune and has finally agreed with what um, his General Zeluzhny has been saying, which is that Ukraine needs to start to build defence. They need to start to fortify positions behind the current front line and um, move their focus from attack into one of def defence. And... Clearly, militarily, they, they need to do this. They are on the back foot now. They are being pushed back across the line. Um, there's even way up north in the Kupiansk area, there are reports there of further Russian gains. Um, in order for them to try to be able to stop the Russians continuing their roll westwards towards the Dnieper, the Ukrainians need to reinforce positions. Now, Zelensky has been holding off on this reportedly because he's been focused on trying to hold Avdivka and take back Bakhmut um, and get across the line at Verbeve down in the Zaporozhye area so that they could claim that they'd breached the Russian Surovikin line. None of this has been successful. It's been extremely expensive in terms of manpower and equipment for the Ukrainians. Zeluzhny reportedly for some time has been saying we need to start reinforcing. Um, I did hear some reports that perhaps Zeluzhny had actually even started that, but further south down near Mikolaev and Odessa in that region, um, preparing for what clearly the Ukrainians are, uh, are seeing coming, which will be a Russian desire to take Mikolaev and Odessa and strip Ukraine, what remains of Ukraine, of having any port access. This. Um, now, so um, the uh, Alexei uh, Goncharenko, who is a deputy in the Verkhovna Rada, the Ukrainian government, he has said he has commented that on um, Vladimir Zelensky's statement um, that the fortification work it must begin in the north. So um, this this will be fortification around Kiev. Hey, the specifically, they will be seeing the writing on the wall and starting to say now, okay, we need to stop Kiev being taken. Um, if we just roll out, go back to a map here for a minute. If we just roll out a little, you can see where most of the front line fighting is here. Sorry, make this a little bigger. This is most of our frontline fighting along here. Now, <clears throat> Kiev is right up here in the north, in the north and uh, northwestern side of this of this map, and this is the Dnieper River, which runs all the way down here, uh, down through Zaporozhye and down towards um, the Black Sea. So, what the what? Zelensky is saying is that they need to start reinforcing areas around here, making layers of defensive areas around here so that the Russians can't push, get to the Dnieper and then get to Kiev, which is, I think, ultimately what the Russians will look to do is move to take Kiev and take all of this land to the east of the Dnieper River. Um, so <clears throat> there is talks now that that's going on. Some are suggesting that this change in heart from Volodymyr Zelensky 
is due to the fact that there has been pr- pressure from the United States. Um, CIA, CIA Director Bill Burns was in Kiev a week ago. Um, the nature of his meeting wasn't made exactly clear, but there is suggestions that he may have been there saying to Zelensky that... <clears throat> You need to start following our game plan. We've got an election to win in the United States. Things aren't looking good for Biden at the moment, and part of it is your fault because your offensive failed. We were counting on that to give him a big war president bump going into November 2024. So instead, we can't just drop this. It's too much of a political problem for us to just give up on Ukraine. So instead, we need you to start building defenses so you can hold the Russians back for a year so that we can give you some more money at the end of next year to do a little squirt of an offensive somewhere and make Biden look good in September or October. Uh, But you've got to hold the line until then. And so Zelensky, who has already said no elections next year, he's claiming now that he'd like to have elections, but most of the people in Ukraine don't want to have elections. Anyhow, so he's said no elections in 2024 because he knows that he will be ousted now this becomes some sort of a lifeline for him. He can, you know, I would suggest the Americans have said, yep, we'll help support you, but you've got to defend. We're not giving you a whole heap of money for the next year. Come come September, October of 2024, we'll get back on the page with you. Give us some time to sort out what's happening in Gaza with the Israelis, and then we'll make it look good just before the election for Biden. And so that's why Zelensky is now going on the defensive. However... They may have found that they've left this too late in some respects. Um, The defences that we're talking about here, yes, they are trenches and things like that, but really what they need to be is fortified fortifications. Activities are in townships to build trenches, but then to fortify and strengthen those trenches with concrete and reinforcing and all that sort of thing. Um, These things take time. And the time that they're choosing to do this in some of the areas they will need to do it is difficult because the ground is still soft. You don't really want to be digging trenches in mud. A good time to be digging in the dirt and digging trenches is when the ground is dry, not super dry, but when it's dry and it hasn't become wet and waterlogged. Um, you want to be digging your trenches as much as you can um, and building these fortifications with heavy equipment. You want you know, big mechanical diggers, tracked equipment, digging trenches for you. Again, if they're trying to dig through mud and slosh, it just fills in on itself and you've got real problems with digging um, in the ground. So had they been doing this two months ago, they would have had opportunities to dig trenches to get their form work in and be able to then concrete and reinforce Um, even concreting. Concreting takes time. You know, if you you need to put in form work first to make things strong, if you've got your form work done and then you get your concreting in, you've got a month before your concrete reaches its maximum strength. So anywhere that you've put any sort of concrete in and it hasn't done its 28 days, it's at subpar strength. And if it's something where you're driving heavy equipment over or if it's something that you expect that's going to be perhaps shelled and you're trying to reinforce it, you need at least a month for that concrete to have set, to have hardened up to its maximum strength. So given the timing now where they're still at the tail end of the Rapportista, where the ground is wet, is muddy, it's difficult for all sorts of equipment to move. It's especially difficult for men to be trying to dig trenches in mud. Just a nightmare. Um... The Ukrainians really don't have a great um, window to operate in now. They are going to have to wait another couple of weeks until the ground freezes everywhere. Now, once the ground is frozen, your heavy equipment works again, you can trench again, and, and it's great because the actual ground is set and hard. You just dig out the chunk that you want. You've got a nice trench. You're good for the winter. Um, of course, it makes it difficult any hand work that men have to do by hand because now they're digging into frozen ground, which is like digging through rock. So again, the opportunity for doing a lot of defensive work in the summer when the conditions would have been great, if that hasn't been done, is a missed opportunity by the Ukrainians in this case. But we'll, we'll see what happens there. Now, while the Ukrainians are now pivoting to build fortifications, just yesterday I saw an article talking about Russia is now beginning to form high-power artillery brigades. 
Now, these aren't brigades for uh, necessarily for the positional um, anti-counter uh, battery, counter artillery battery type activity. These are big, heavy pieces of self-propelled equipment that will be used with um, specialised drone unmanned recon units and they will go hunting defences just like Ukraine is starting to build. So these are going to be brigades which will be populated with things like the 2S7 Peon, the 230mm self-propelled gun um, and the 240 millimeter 2s4 tulip mortar um, so just as ukraine is starting to make its decision to go and build fortifications the russians are already developing specialized heavy artillery self-propelled heavy artillery brigades which will just go to townships where the russians believe there are uh, fortifications in place and they will just work on them um, and, and blast them apart, allowing the infantry to then get in there. In, in continued um, bad news for the Ukrainians, we have the first reported deaths of women in the front lines in Ukraine. Two different, two different scenarios. Um, one is a FPV drone footage of an FPV drone striking a Ukrainian location, and in the footage which was reviewed later it lo does look as though one of the soldiers in the trench just before the the drone hits it and explodes in the in the trench is a woman so we seem to have had the first video verification of a ukrainian young ukrainian woman's death in this conflict on the front line the second report is a more interesting one um there is there is some um question about exactly what has happened but the story as it is being reported is that up on the um up on the northern line perhaps the kupiansk front up there a woman has been employed in the role of a, like a motivational role a psychologist um if you remember in world war one there was the order of the white feather so in World War I, when, um, <clears throat> when the nation Britain and all this were you know, in, in this massive fight, and the French were in this massive fight with the Germans, and it was trench warfare, and they were throwing many, many, many men at the front line. Any young men who were left at home, who hadn't volunteered to go, um, one of the... Um, Propaganda, one of the tactics that was used to convince men to go, and especially young men, to go and join the fighting, was that they would have groups of young women, you know, like women 16, 17, 18, who would walk around the towns, and if they saw a young man who was in civilian clothes but was of a fighting age, they would walk up to him and they would pin a white feather on his, on his lapel, on his jacket. And it was a sign of cowardice that he, you know, he was in order of the white feather. He was soft and should be off fighting. And so you can imagine a young man, 17 or 18, he's got these young women around him saying, oh, you're a coward, you're a coward. Here, have one of these white feathers. You know, that was compelling for them to just go, fuck this, I'm going to the recruiting station. You know, I'm not a coward and get themselves sent off to war. It seems as though a similar sort of tactic was being employed here. If this, if this story is correct, that this woman psychologist was there on the front line and she was there attempting to convince the Ukrainian forces to go to fight because they were obviously recognising that on the front where they were fighting, they were going to be overwhelmed and they were just going to be slaughtered. Um, they didn't want to die. And so reportedly she was using quite harsh tactics abusive language, calling them all sorts of names, belittling them, um, calling them cowards and all of that. And her commanding officer there in the group shot her is the story that has happened, um, that's coming out. Um, some more of the backstory is that reportedly the commanding officer said that she was 
killed in, 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 some, in some battle and part of the conflict, but her family, for some reason, are pursuing it and are saying that that wasn't what happened to her. And now the story has come out is that this is what was happening. She was trying to compel these men to go and fight, and they, they, they shot her. Um, Look, I can't. I'm not there. I don't know. I don't know which of the cases is is true, but it's certainly the it is certainly that story of her being killed by her own commanding officer, which is the one that's being reported at this stage. So, in either case, regardless, you know, Ukraine is now starting to lose its young women on the front line of this conflict, um, and even the on the topic of of women in this conflict, um, there are reports now that. Um, uh, Ukrainian military intelligence chief um, Krylo Budanov, his wife has become a victim of this conflict where reportedly her and perhaps some of perhaps her security detail or assistance have been poisoned. She's been hospitalised um, reportedly with some form of heavy metal poisoning. Um, her condition isn't given in what I've seen of late. She's apparently undergoing treatment in hospital. Um, some, while it's not clear who has done this at this stage, um, there are articles coming out now from um, some Ukrainian telegram channels and reporting from them that there are three growing factions, power factions within the Ukrainian military and, and political command at the moment. One, obviously, Vladimir President Zelensky, his group, him trying to cling to power. There's a group forming behind um, General Zeluzhny. Now, Zeluzhny seems to have you know the backing of the, the military, and Zelensky is seeing Zeluzhny as a real threat. Um, reportedly, the fact there has been talk that General Zeluzhny was going to be let go, fired, and be the scapegoat for the failure of the um, offensive. Um, reportedly, he has no plans for 2024 offensively, uh, but that's not the reason that Zelensky is, um, doesn't want him around. They believe that's because he has the support of the armed forces. He could effectively stage a, a power grab, a coup, and take over. Interestingly enough... Because he does have this support of the armed forces, this is now being reported as the reason that Zeluzhny hasn't been fired and hasn't lost his position is because Zelensky feels that it would backfire on him. If he were to fire him, that that would cause a military uprising and that would backfire on him. So there's Zeluzhny is another power group in there. But there's also reporting that the third one is Budanov uh, or Bunarov. Um, and you can imagine why. He's the head of the military intelligence, the GRU there. So he has details on everyone. He has information on everyone. I imagine that um, much, much like J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI, you know, he would have invested a great deal of his resources, time in investigating people of power, um, finding out things about their lives which they may wish not to be known publicly, perhaps even doing things like setting honey traps and what have you to generate that information so that he has some blackmail and power over those people. Now, I'm just speculating that he would do this. Um, I don't know that he has, but it wouldn't be the first time that someone in a position of being the head of the um, military intelligence service has done something like that. So it's very likely that Budinov also has power and sway over people and would be able to influence people if he were to look to increase his position in Ukraine. So certainly we see some sort of... Um, power struggles rising there, and perhaps that is the cause behind um, Budinov's wife apparently being poisoned. It doesn't seem as though it was a failed attempt on Budinov himself. It seems as though it was targeted at his wife. Um, it hasn't been successful in terms of being um, fatal to her. Again, I don't know her condition, um, if it, but if it is true, perhaps it was yeah, somewhat of a, something of a warning, perhaps, not going after Budanov himself directly, but a warning. I, I, I don't know. Um, moving on to some wider, some news wider. 
um, than just just in Ukraine itself. NATO Secretary General Jen Stoltenberg has come out this week with a um, an interview, and I want to just read it. I just want to read it to you, um, and then I might contrast it with something which has come out from the Washington Post a day later. But Secretary General Jen Stoltenberg has had this to say this week, as I'm quoting from him. As Ukraine has moved forward, Russia has fallen backward. It is now weaker politically, militarily, and economically. All of this underlies Putin's strategic mistake in invading Ukraine. So that's a summary of what he said, but now I'll just read a bit more of it. He says, Last year, Ukraine won the battles for Kiev, Kharkov, and Kherson. This year, they continued to inflict heavy losses on Russia. Ukraine has recaptured 50% of the territory that Russia originally seized. In the Black Sea, the Ukrainians have pushed back the Russian fleet and established routes for grain exports, bolstering global food security. Most importantly, Ukraine has prevailed as a sovereign, independent, democratic nation. This is a major achievement, a big win. As Ukraine has moved forward, Russia has fallen backward. It is now weaker politically, militarily and economically. Politically, Russia is losing influence in its near abroad, not only in Ukraine, but in the Caucasus and Central Asia. Russia is also becoming much more dependent on China. Year by year, Moscow is mortgaging its future to Beijing. Militarily, Russia has lost a substantial part of its conventional forces, hundreds of aircraft, thousands of tanks, and more than 300,000 casualties. Economically, Russia is also under pressure. Oil and gas revenues are dropping. Russian banking assets are under sanctions. Over 1,000 foreign companies have stopped or scaled down their operations in the country. And 1.3 million people left Russia last year. All of this underlines Putin's strategic mistake in invading Ukraine. Now, for any of you who have been following this channel or... Um, just following the situation of what's happening here, you will recognise that there are many statements in there from Stoltenberg that appear to exist in a reality other than the one that we live in. Um, and many of the thing, the statements that he said, I think, true, but they are misleading in the overall situation. For example, a thousand foreign companies have stopped or scaled down their operations in the country. That's true. But those gaps have been filled by Russian domestic businesses who are now thriving. And Russia as a nation is thriving because of its lack of reliance now on international imports and instead is developing things domestically. So while Jens is trying to spin this as a negative, uh, ne negative for Russia, in actual effect, it's a positive for Russia. Um, oil and gas revenues are dropping. This, I'm not sure about. It seems to me like oil and gas revenues have picked up for the Russians. Um, they are still selling oil and gas to Europe. It's just that a lot of it now is done at a premium. And it's being sold through intermediaries. Um, the suggesting that Ukraine has... Um, pushed back the Russian fleet and established routes for grain exports. This completely ignores the fact that the ports of Odessa are destroyed and that there are really no nations taking the risk of sending their ships into Odessa to transport grain. The grain initiative has ceased. Um, this is a this is a very interesting speech from Jens, um, and this is one which I think will people will remember for some time because it just flies in the face of reality in so many in so many different ways. Here, um, you know, he talks about <clears throat> he talks about Ukraine winning the battles for Kiev, Kharkiv, and Kherson, but doesn't mention 
that the battle for Kiev was not really a battle for Kiev. At that time, in February and March of 2022, the Russians were negotiating with the Ukrainians. This has been admitted now by the Ukrainians and that there was almost pen on paper. And as part of those negotiations, Putin pulled his forces back from Kiev. Um, in, in Kharkiv, in Kharkiv, <clears throat> The Ukrainians did push the Russians out of the Kharkiv area, but the Russians did not have many troops there at that time. They retreated out of that area, inflicting heavy losses on Ukraine. So it was a victory, but one that came at a very big cost for the Ukrainians. And in Kherson, Kherson was a... um, a strategic decision by the Russians to move themselves from the <clears throat> from the west side of the Dnieper, where they were going to struggle to stay there and just pull themselves back across the Dnieper. Now, you, we can see that the, the Ukrainians are now demonstrating the... Um, The sense in that Russian decision, when we look at what is happening in uh, the Kherson region at the moment, around Krinky, where the Ukrainians are struggling to establish a foothold there because it is so difficult for them to be able to support their forces who have made it across to the east side of the Dnieper there. Um, They are just being continually uh, bombed by Fab 500s and artillery and FPV drones by the Russians. The Russians are seeing this as a tactical failure for the Ukrainians and a success for themselves because they are able to just sit there, watch the Ukrainians come across the river in boats and then just pick them off. The the Ukrainians are losing men in this Kherson region for exactly the reason why the Russians pulled back from Kherson across the river, because the Russians did not want to be in this situation where they could not resupply and could not rotate and would be able to be picked off by the Ukrainians. So, Jen, while yes, in some respects, what Jen says is, is correct, it doesn't give you the real context or real understanding of why some of these victories for Ukraine really would be um, in Kharkiv, perhaps, you know, a, a pyrrhic victory with heavy losses for little actual r- reward. Um, and it completely ignores the strategic element of what's happened here, where the Russians have pulled back. They had less forces at that time. They're now reinforcing and they will push back and they will take the Kharkiv region again when they when they want to. So anyhow, so that's Jen's. Um, what was also um, telling was a series of questions or about six or seven questions that followed that. And they were softball questions from the reporters. They went on to ask happy things and other questions. None of what he said was question. They went on to ask questions about, oh, well, now when when will the F-16s be arriving? And Jens would say, look, I don't know. It's so great that we're training up F-16 pilots, but I can't tell you yet when they'll be there. They then went on to ask about Israel and what he thought about Israel. And they went, then went on to ask about Kosovo and what did they think about Kosovo? Um at no stage did anyone ask any questions about what's happening in Avdivka, you know, what's happening in the Kupiansk area, why um, aren't advances being made by the Ukrainians. It was a completely engineered statement to, at a time when Ukraine is suffering badly, to put something out in the media so that those people who aren't following closely will go, oh, I heard Jen say everything's going great, everything must be going good, when in fact it's not. Um, the, we can contrast this a little bit with... Um, This came out from the Washington Post just this week. Um, 20 months ago, after Vladimir Putin had launched his full-scale invasion of Ukraine, many high-ranking Russians believed that the end was near. The economy faced disaster as they saw it, and the Putin regime was on the brink of collapse. I don't think it ever really was, but anyhow, that's how the Washington Post starts. Then, they say, "...today the mood has changed dramatically." Business leaders, officials and ordinary people tell me that the economy has stabilised, defying the Western sanctions that were once expected to have a devastating effect. Putin's, pardon me, Putin's regime, they say, looks more stable than at any other time in the past two years. Real estate prices are rising and construction is booming. At the beginning of 2022, most global brands left Russia, leaving empty storefronts in malls and streets. Now, the gaps have been filled by Russian counterparts. Um... 
on that topic, that's true. Russian counterparts, domestic things are filling them, filling them. But also there was an example of a, a French sporting uh, company who announced that they were leaving Russia, but have now created a new brand name and have popped up with new stores. Um, so while some of these that Jens is talking about have left, others haven't really left. They've still got a place in the market there in, in Russia. Um, it goes on saying that before the war, Russian business executives generally kept their savings in the West. Um, now, as one Russian oligarch told me, that door has been slammed shut, sparking an investment boom at home in Russia. After the invasion, the International Monetary Fund estimated that the Russian economy would fall by 2.3% in 2023. In January 2023, the IMF changed its forecast, predicting growth of 0.3%. It changed its forecast at least two more times during the year, and in October of 2023, it has finally settled on a figure of growth, not falling by 2.3%, but growth of 2.2%. Now, the Russians themselves are talking about growth for the year of now over 3%. So, interesting, Jen saying one thing from NATO, and then the, um, the Washington Post saying completely, completely different things there. Um, just one last thing I just want to finish off on, again, around the area here. So this is Armenia. So we talked about Armenia a few weeks ago when... Um, um the armenian the armenian um ethnic um residents of nagano karabakh area um were ev evacuated out of there left that area and effectively uh, Dennis pa um pashinyan the prime minister of armenia effectively said to azerbaijan that Yes, the Nagano Karabakh area is Azerbaijani. You have it. Um, this was seen as a way for him to close down this dispute so that in the future Armenia could look towards things like moving into the EU. Um, so Pashinyan is moving Armenia closer to the West. And this is becoming more and more evident. Um, there was a. There was a. Um, summit for the Collective Treaty Security Organization or the CSTO in, in Minsk and this week and um, Pashinyan has informed the Belarusian president Alexander Lushenko that he won't be attending it. Now the CSTO is made up of Russia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan and Belarus and Armenia. Um, there was actually, I believe, talk that Armenia was supposed to be hosting the CSTO, and they said they're not doing that, and now the leader is not actually even going to attend. Um, France has been making overtures with Armenia, um, and Azerbaijan is now calling this out that they believe that France may be laying the ground for a new regional war by arming Armenia. Um, there are talks going on between France and Armenia for the supply of weapons, military support. Um, France is claiming this, that they are doing that to assist find a durable peace and aid the sovereignty of Armenia and respect their sovereignty. Uh, Azerbaijan are saying that they are doing it in an attempt to undermine the region and to kick off a regional conflict there. Um, there is a Russian military base in Armenia and if Armenia looks to remove that, to move the Russian base, tell the Russians to get out. If they do then start to um, accept some of these military offers from France, um, they have been conducting some military activities with the US. If this continues, then 
Armenia is starting to look like the new Ukraine. It's putting itself into that position where it is moving away from traditionally being friendly with Russia and having support from Russia, the Russian military base in the country there, to now relying on the West. And this is an interesting tactic to take at this stage when you see what is happening to Ukraine, where Ukraine is being ground up and destroyed by the NATO-led, US-led conflict against Russia happening in Ukraine. The conflict's not happening in Poland. It's not happening in Germany. It's not happening in UK. It's certainly not happening in the US. Now, Armenia, if they're not careful, will find themselves in a position where they will be receiving US support and French support and NATO support in a conflict with, with Russian forces, but that won't be happening in US or the UK. It will be happening in Armenia. And so Armenia needs to be very careful here, or they will find themselves in the position of the new Ukraine, and they will be laying down the lives of their young men, and ultimately young women, if they're not careful, for the US, not for themselves. So we'll just, we'll just keep an eye on what happens with Armenia over the coming months, just to see what does happen to see if perhaps um, Pashinyan gets to a point where he recognises and looks at Ukraine and says, well, what's happening there isn't good. We don't want that to happen to us. Maybe we will back out of this a little bit um, and and not go so far with the West. There was some talk that perhaps Pashinyan was trying to play a clever game of moving closer to the US to try to sort of spite Russia a little bit and to try to garner Russia's support, you know, basically like, You've broken up with your 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 boyfriend, and so you then go and um, you go and talk to another boy in front of your ex boyfriend. You really want your ex boyfriend, but you're talking to someone else to try and get their emotions up, to get them to fight for you, to give you more interests. Maybe I don't know. Seems like a very risky strategy. Um, I get the feeling that for some reason Pashinyan feels like it's he's just going to align with the West, and it may be for his own personal benefit. He may be receiving. Great benefit for doing this in some financial sense. Perhaps, again, I'm just speculating here. But if he continues down that path, where they are, um, and they're not a large nation, um, they, they could very easily find themselves being caught in the middle of a fight between NATO-supplied forces and weapons and the Russians and just get their country destroyed like it's happening in Ukraine. Okay. That's enough for, um, for now. I hope you are having a great weekend. I look forward to talking to you again soon.